Hello and welcome to the L.W. Paul Living History Farm. Today we're going to be talking about sewing and the sewing machine that we use here at the farm. Now sewing was a very important part of daily life on the farm. Uh, the farm wife and probably most of the women in that family would have learned how to sew and would have done it quite frequently for their clothing, for their family's clothing, even for things like curtains and bedding and other household goods. Sewing has always been an important part of farm life, but uh, by the 1930s and 1940s, it was in an interesting transitional period. Uh, up until the early uh, 20th century, lots of sewing had been done in the home out of necessity. But by the early 20th century, a lot of clothes were available pre-made in the stores. This doesn't mean that everyone bought all their clothing from the store, though. It was often a lot cheaper to buy fabric and then sew your own clothes at home. The fabrics we have uh, in our collection show some feed sacks and these were parts of the bags that you could buy animal feed or flour in. A lot of the earlier feed sacks uh, featured just a simple print like this or were plain white. They may have the company name on it, they might have some information about that feed, but it was pretty simple overall. But uh, beginning in the early 20th century, and especially in the 1930s, a lot of companies realized that women were using some of these feed sacks in order to make clothing for their family. Um, sewing is considered a very resourceful part of running a farm. Uh, instead of going out and buying clothes in the stores, you can make it for cheaper on your own, and a lot of these women were reusing fabric from these feed sacks. Uh, by the 1930s, a lot of feed sack companies were printing their feed sacks with cheap cotton prints, some of them very colorful, others very intricate. Uh, the ones you see out here are original examples of fabrics that you could either buy from the store or get from feed sacks. Now another thing that helped a lot of women make their own clothes at home were paper patterns. Uh, up until this point you might have to draft your own pattern and have some access to paper patterns through things like ladies magazines. But by the 1930s and 40s a lot of these patterns were being mass produced in a variety of sizes on very thin, cheap and affordable paper so anyone could go out and buy a pattern and make a dress themselves even if they didn't have any prior professional training in sewing. So a lot of these machines were passed down from generation to generation. Uh, they were an incredibly important part of the living room or family space in every house. Uh, and they were incredibly sturdy, uh, and they had to be, in order to be passed down and repaired throughout several generations. So these sewing machines would have been uh, considered family heirlooms in, in certain families. Uh, there were electric machines available by the early 20th century, but a lot of women still used uh, older styles such as this one that are a treadle sewing machine. They're run uh, by a foot pedal and they all are also run by this belt here. And this is the balance wheel that helps that sewing machine run. So this is the machine I'll be working with here today. This is a Singer model number 15 and this style was patented in 1910 and um, it was common for quite some time. It uses very popular uh, styles of design. This one is known as the Sphinx pattern, also known sometimes as the Memphis pattern. And you'll see that in the gold detailing here and on the other side as well. Now every sewing machine uh, is a little different when it comes to threading the needle. Uh, and this machine is no exception, but every bit of equipment you see here is meant to keep that thread in proper tension so that all the stitches are even and of the right tension so they don't slip out of the fabric, but they're tight enough to hold that fabric together securely. So I'm going to be showing you how this machine is threaded. So the spool of thread goes onto the winder there, through this eye, around this thumb here, through the hook, then onto another eye, through one more loop, and then through the eye of the needle. Now this machine is somewhat unique for having what's known as a vibrating shuttle. That is the thread that comes from underneath. So when the machine is running, that shuttle goes back and forth, as you can see underneath that plate there. But this shuttle is removed pretty easily. 
as you can see, the uh, bobbin comes out like this. And so winding the bobbin itself could be done by hand, uh, but it is done a lot more quickly through this bobbin winder here. So I'll be getting a fresh bobbin and then showing you how this uh, bobbin is wound as well. So in order to thread the bobbin or wind the bobbin, uh, you're going to start out by tying the end of the thread to the uh, shaft of the bobbin here. Then between the spool and that bobbin itself, you're going to place it through this eye. And then uh, you're going to place that thread through an eye on this bobbin winder and through yet one more. You can slip out rather easily before placing it in this uh, securer here. Now, uh, the one important thing to remember is you have to shift this bobbin winder up in order for it to engage with the wheel. Um, so this is in its uh, normal position. I'm shifting it up so it makes contact uh, with the balance wheel and the belt here. I also have to disengage the needle here. There's a knob on the end of the balance wheel that'll prevent this needle from moving. So by moving just the center of that wheel to the left, it prevents what, that needle from moving uh, and it helps focus on uh, winding that bobbin itself. So the bobbin is in place and I can now power this uh, with the belt in my foot and it's going to start winding up that thread. So the bobbin is threaded now and I've cut the end of that thread so I can just go ahead and take it out of there and set it in its case. And you'll see there's a diagonal line here that thread can just slip through. I tuck it under that arm, pull that end through, and slip it down here. It has a little notch on the side, it just slips right in and it'll be ready to use. So I'm going to cover it up with this plate here and that just helps make sure that all that gear and machinery down there does not get dust or dirt in it uh, and keeps it running smoothly. Now once this uh, machine is threaded, it'll be able to just scoop down there and pick that thread up.